to our Wednesday morning class coming to you from Heartlight Spiritual Center here in Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, let's just take a moment to center ourselves and uh, find that sacred space within ourselves where the presence always resides. And I believe that that is in the heart. So let us just move to the heart for a moment and set an intention for only the highest good to be accomplished today through this class. So we take a deep breath in. We breathe in all this new, wonderful, pure energy that is penetrating into a third dimension that is breaking down in every way. And we are here to be channels and to be open for that energy to come through us. Think for just a moment what it's like to have muddy water. And the more pure water that you put in that muddy water, the less muddy it becomes until pretty soon you come to the tipping point of where it is not muddy, but it becomes clear water. This is the way I see what's going on in the world today. If there's enough of us that is an open channel for that pure spirit to come through, it is going to take away all of the muck and the dirt and all of the things that are breaking down that is not serving us as a people, as a planet today. Exhale and let go of those things which are no longer serving us. Maybe they served us at one time, but they do not serve us now. As we open our hearts to be a full and clear channel for the divine spirit of higher fifth dimension and beyond to come through, so be it and so it is. Divine Holy Spirit, we recognize you as the true teacher, the voice of God in this third dimension that with the whisper of your spirit of your and your voice is always leading us on toward higher dimensions of consciousness helping us to forget those things that no longer serve us as we are remembering those things that we have forgotten before we ever incarnated into this human experience in this dimension Teach us, lead us, guide us. We ask this in the wonderful name of the living presence of the Christ that dwells within our hearts and within our lives today. And so it is. Our reading today is from today's daily word. It is, I am safe and secure in God. The protective power of God is always mine to call upon. If I begin to feel off balance or unsafe, I pause to move into a time of sacred prayer. I breathe deeply, place my hand on my heart, and quietly affirm my divinity is inspired wisdom and compassionate love which guides me and others to a more safe time. I am safe. Whether tending to tasks, working at my job, or traveling on vacation, I may move through a range of emotions as I encounter situations that challenge me. No matter what is happening around me, I can respond from a peaceful place within me. And remember that I can remain anchored in spiritual principles. I am free from fear because I trust the presence of God within me. In God, there is nothing to fear. In God, there is only love. Our scripture is Psalm 16 and 1. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And so it is. All right. Well, <clears throat> let's continue on. A uh, few that have been following for the last two or three weeks, we've been addressing some of the questions in this little book called The Question Book. And uh, this book, again, was put together many years ago, back in the late 80s, 
based upon the questions that people were asking. You know, was in the 80s was a great exodus of people moving out of mainstream religion. It actually began in the 70s with what was called the charismatic movement. And then by the end of uh, that time, there began to be a manifestation of such uh, ministries of uh, uh, what's called the manifested sons of God movement, which is where I came in. And that was a powerful expansion of consciousness because up until that time, we, pro we pro was projecting our divinity on one person and that was on the body of Jesus, that Jesus was the only begotten son of God. And then that very same Bible that taught that also said in Romans 8 that those that are led by the spirits, they are the sons and daughters of God. Hmm, made you think. Is Jesus the only son of God? And yet the Bible tells us that we all are sons and daughters of God. So we begin to step up and share. We didn't worship and see Jesus way above us but we saw Jesus as one of us who had come to a quickening, a quickening, an awakening that, that, I, that identity was beyond the physical body and the five senses. And we call that presence the Christ. Remember Peter said when Jesus asked, who am I? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He didn't say just the body, Jesus was the son of God, but the Christ was the son of God. And we share in that Christ. Christ cannot be contained in one person or one body because it is an expression of eternity, of that which transcends time and space and boundaries that are in space itself. Corinthians, it's very clear that as the body or the church is made of one, but many members, so is Christ. So is Christ want one, but made of many members or expressions. So we are an expression of all that Jesus is and what Jesus came to know. And in that brings us to our subject, because at that point that Jesus knew who he truly was, he began to go through the process we call death, death. So we're gonna talk about death and that's what we started last Wednesday. And these are subjects that I know you're gonna have a reaction. I don't wanna hear about death. I think I'm gonna just turn this off. It's too negative, too much is going on in the world. The last thing I need is to hear about death. Well, I believe we need to rise to the occasion to understand that some of these things that have been the most fearful dogmas and doctrines and constructs of this dimension that has made us so fearful are the things we need to look at and see them behind the symbolism. And when we do, they come alive with spirit. They come to life with opportunity to grow, to awaken, and to manifest. So yes, Jesus went through a death. Now, whether it was a physical death or not is up for grabs as far as I'm concerned. I can't prove rather he physically died or not. What I want to talk about as a metaphysician is death from a spiritual point of view. So let's look at the word death, first of all, as it is translated from the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek and Aramaic. Uh, and the word is nekros, N-E-K-R-O-S, nekros. Here's what it means, lifeless, useless, separation. Not one definition of this word ever means non-existence. Death does not mean annihilation of non-existence. Example, the first example that came to me was the prodigal son story because the prodigal son said he was dead to his father. In other words, when he left and separated himself into a far land somewhere, he was out of the range of the consciousness of his father. Was, did he exist? Absolutely. He just existed out of range of consciousness. So when things are out of the range of consciousness, they are dead to us until they're resurrected. I have spent most of five decades resurrecting things I did not learn or know 
as a human being. I wasn't taught it in my religion. I wasn't taught it in my family. I wasn't taught it in society. I wasn't taught it in culture. I didn't even know it was in me. It was dead to me. And then, as I opened up to let Spirit teach me and Spirit taught me things that I didn't know existed because I wasn't conscious of them. They were resurrected up in me into my consciousness. And I had a knowing, a knowing. And therefore, death means something that can be separate or unconscious from us. Another scripture that's kind of interesting I want to give you is faith without works is dead. Now, it doesn't mean that faith is dead, it means that you are dead to faith. And you know what? In this time that we live in, in which there's so much fear, every time we buy into fear, then we are not conscious of faith. Because in faith, there is no fear. In spirit, there is no fear. In God, there is no fear. Fear and love cannot be two realities on the same level of consciousness. One has to be real, one is not real. So either fear is real to you in which you, love is dead to you, or love is alive in you in which fear becomes dead to you or unconscious of it. But because of this time of so much fear and what's going on in the climate we're living in, we get knocked out consciously. And then at that moment, we're knocked out consciously. We forget who we are. We forget that we are the expression of what we call God. And when we say God, that's a generalization because God is many things. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. God is wisdom. These are the attributes that make up what we call God. So faith without Manifestation is dead, unseen, unmanifested. Love without loving something is dead or in the state of unconsciousness. Ephesians 5 and 14 says, Wake you that sleep and rise from the dead. He's not talking about out in a graveyard somewhere of somebody who's physically not manifesting life any longer but it's talking about when you're asleep, unconscious, or not in a state. But it says you can arise from that death state, unconscious uh, state. And when you do, Christ gives life. Gives life what? To who you are. Life to love, life to peace, life to joy, all the wonderful attributes that make up God. Let me give you another one that I really like, and this is from my Mirror Bible. As you know how much I love it, Ephesians 2.1. This is really good. Picture when God found us, we were in a death trap of an inferior lifestyle, constantly living below the blueprint measure of our lives or in a sin state of consciousness. So let's talk about that. We've learned that sin, which is harmetia in the Greek, means missing the mark. But here's what also what it means. Living in a distorted, disoriented, bankrupt identity. (laughs) Sin means to live out of context with the blueprint of one's design. Isn't that good? living out of the context of the blueprint of one's design. And this is a good one. Being out of tune with God's divine law of original harmony. Missing the mark. Missing the mark. Missing the mark. I've been watching a series. In fact, it's my second time to watch it. It's called Rain on Netflix. And it's 15th century... Uh, Scotland, England, France, and uh, the whole history of that. I I just am drawn to that type of history. Maybe I lived back then. I don't know, but I'm very drawn to it. Uh, But I've been watching it uh, uh, a lot. 
And it's, it's very interesting. Uh, King James is in it, who finally translates the Bible and all of that kind of thing in there. But the thing I started noticing is how much archery is in this series. They're always out with bows and arrows doing archery. They weren't playing football. They weren't playing basketball. They weren't playing the modern sports of our day, but they played the sport of their day, which was archery. And they learned to be proficient of reaching that bullseye. And if they missed it, they were in harmetia, or missing the mark. Now, the word mark comes from an interesting word in English, in Greek, which is karagma. Karagma is where we get the word character or nature. So when you're not walking in your divinity and who you truly been created to be, you're missing your mark. When you're not walking in love, you're missing your mark. When you're not living in peace that passes understanding, you're missing your mark. If you're not living in the attributes that make you the expression of the divine, you're missing the mark. Then there's times when things just come together, right? Spirit flows, you get epiphanies, you get clarity, bullseye. That's where we want to be in that place. Death is a stripping away of all that is not you. And you know what? It feels like a death. <laughs> We're so much a people who have learned survival through adaption. We adapt. People are adapting right now. A few months ago, to see someone in a mask, you would have wondered what in the world is going on. Now it's just taken for granted. People wear masks. We don't question it. We don't look uh, twice at what people are doing because we've adapted to the fact of wearing these masks. We adapt to not having the freedom to maybe go and travel the way that we'd like to right now. We're adapting to that. I remember many years ago, and this is a simple story, but it was, a, it was a research of how that these little insects, whatever they were, but these insects flew around wherever they wanted to go, and all of a sudden they were captured and put in this large glass container. They were confined. And they were wired to be free. So they kept trying to get out of the glass. And they'd bang themselves and fall to the floor. And they'd get up and do it again. And finally, they stopped doing it because they adapted. Then they had offspring. And the offspring never tried to even get out of it because they were born in that boundary, in the, with those boundaries. This is what things happen to us if we're not careful, is we adapt and we start thinking that the norm is within the boundaries of how we are formed. Now, I'm not saying that we should not follow what we're following right now to do what we can do, but that doesn't mean we have to give up our inner freedom. And, and, and another thing is choose to do what you're doing. Don't be made to do it. Choose to wear your masks. Choose to stay six feet apart. Choose to not maybe travel as much. Choose to not maybe find yourself at large gatherings that you don't feel. But that's your power. It's not power out there. It's your power that you're doing, and that's fine. I have no trouble with that. But if you're doing it because they're telling you to fear something, I'm concerned about that because that will put you in a state of death by stripping away something that is not you. The secret of life is to die before you die. <laughs> I love that. To die before you die and find there is no death. The death I'm talking about is a liberation. It's a liberation. It is a way that we can be liberated. Apart from a dreamless sleep, there's only one other involuntary portal. 
and it opens briefly at the time of what we call physical death. Now, really, I don't believe in physical death. I believe that life eventually leaves the body and leaves the body lifeless, and we call that a physical death. Even if you missed all the other opportunities for spiritual realization. Now, there's people right now that have had no experience with any spiritual realization whatsoever. They've totally put all their power, all their consciousness into living within the confinement of a third dimension continuum. Just like those insects in that cage. This is where we live. But there's others such as those that come here to Heartlight and other many, many different communities across the world and in America are there because they've had an experience that they've entered some portal that has brought them out of the sleep of the world and to a certain level and state of awakening. That's why I'm attracted toward this new thought metaphysical community for the best label I can give you, is because people are there because of an experience, not because they went to a theology school and learned it, or they made it another belief system or another religion, but something happened to them. Maybe they were sitting in their uh, particular religion that they were raised in, or the church that they'd gone to uh, most of the time, and they sat there listening to the sermon, and the sermon was not resonating, and all of a sudden, the heart came alive and said, this is not the God that lives in you. This is not the message that is feeding my soul or my spirit. And what did we do? We got up out of a far country, Mm, just like that prodigal son who was dead to his father, said, and when he had spent all, wow, he spent all. In other words, he came to a place to find out that nothing was going to work for him if he stayed there. I did. I said in my church and my religion, I wanted validation from my family. My family were very involved in the church and in the ministry. I wanted to be a part of them. It's my human instinct. But I sat there and listened to this God of judgment and condemnation, and I felt fearful. I know I remember... I don't know how young I would have been, very young, very young, maybe three, four years old. I don't know. But the fact that I uh, remember this, this service in which they preached your first night in hell. That was the sermon, what your first night in hell was going to be like. I'm this little kid taking this in and whatever and about how we're going to meet the devil, and, and it was the devil with the, you know, the one with the red suit and the horns and all that kind of thing. And then after church, I remember being in my dad's arms and this man wanted to hold me and he had this red complexion and I began to scream because I thought the devil was trying to take me out of the arms of my father, my natural dad. Now that cannot be healthy for a child. That is something I have had to deal with that's deep into my first chakra, the subconscious of those first few years that was making my rude assumptions about what things were. Wow. I found a portal. Later in life, I found a portal that took me out of man's organized religions. I love this. Here's what the scripture says about that. It says that you should move out of anything that is made of the traditions of men that make my power of no effect. (laughs) Isn't that great? You shouldn't be in anything. I don't care what it is, politically, religiously, or anything. Anything that is stifling your true spiritual capacity and potential to be all that you were created to be. Find a portal in consciousness and come out of her. That's a scripture. Come out of her. Be no more a partaker of her sins. And it's talking about there actually 
religion, if you read it. Anyway, there are countless accounts by people who have had visual impressions of this portal. Now, this is at the moment of life leaving the physical body. And the reason that life leaves the physical body at a certain point is because of the fact that the body is conditioned to only hold life from a limited point of view or measurement. Some don't even stay in the body a few minutes. Some two years, three years. Some people live 80. Some people, I, I just read somebody's living 116 years old right now. So there's different limits of time that life can sustain itself in the physical body. And I won't get into that, but there's a lot of reasons for that. It could be ancestry, it could be DNA, it could be whatever, it could be the, uh, the way uh, the cards fall genetically for someone. That's a great mystery. I'm not sure that we totally understand, but we know it's appointed unto man once to die. It's an appointment unto man. So the appointments are all differently unless you find a portal. So when life leaves, whenever that is, 80, 70, 90, 100 years old, there is a brief time that the portal opens. And people get this visual impression at the point that that happens, that they're leaving the physical, that they see it as a radiant light and then re many people move through that light. Some don't. Some return back because their time is not finished. And we call that what? A near-death experience. Many of them also spoke of a sense of a blissful serenity and deep peace. I heard a doctor recently who works for a, a doctor of hospice. And he says, I've never heard anyone, and, and here, here's what he's against. He's against the way we re, uh, re, uh, resuscitate people and put them on machines and, and shock them and everything to get them back. He said, everybody we've ever done that who had a near-death experience and went to the other side said, why did you bring me back? They tasted of such a bliss of happiness and freedom that they didn't want to come back. I've never heard anybody who said they wanted to come back that has been sent back. Many of them spoke of a sense of blissfulness, serenity, and deep peace. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it is described as the luminous splendor of the colorless light of emptiness. Oh, I like that. I'm going to read that again. It's described as the luminous splendor of the colorless light we call it the white light of emptiness. doesn't mean it's empty. It means that you are empty of every attribute of your human ego. You don't take it over there with you. You are totally liberated and free. You're not only going into the light, you are the light. You don't not just going to God, you are God. You're not going into peace. You are the peace. It says that this emptiness is your own true self. Now, the Buddhists have this. They understand this divine emptiness, this void, as not a place of no th nothing, but a place of no things that have identified us into the body realm or the, or the sensory realm. This portal opens up briefly, now get this, unless you have already encountered the dimension of the unmanifested in your lifetime, you will miss it. Most people carry too much residual resistance, too much fear, too much attachment to sensory experience, too much identification with the manifested world. So they see the portal 
turn away in fear, and then lose consciousness. Most of what happens after that is involuntary and automatic. Eventually, now this is important, eventually there will be another round of birth and death. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's not a one-time thing, folks. Even if you miss it in a lifetime, divine grace and wisdom says, let's try it again. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't you glad that when your kids did something bad, you didn't send them to your room forever, their room forever? But after whatever uh, correction that you gave them, you say, let's do this again. Let's see what you've learned. And if they've learned the lesson, they don't have to go through that again because they have raised their consciousness. If they haven't, then more is applied for correction. And it's not because you hate them. You're not judging them. It's because you love them. You're a parent that's forming their life. And sometimes it takes more than one time of correction for something. Eventually, there will be another round of birth and death. Their presence wasn't strong enough yet for conscious immortality. Mm, such great words. What I'm reading from is called Death Deconstructed. Isn't that a great title? Death Deconstructed. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 22, it says, In Adam we all die, but in Christ we are made alive. And that's what I call Adam's dream. I've taught on that so much here. That a deep sleep came upon Adam. And everything from that sleeping state that's projected becomes the world you live in is what they call maya or illusion because it's in the dream. It's in the dream. The Bible from beginning to end is a call to awake. Awake thou that sleepest and shake yourself from the dust. It's everywhere. Scripture after scripture I can give you. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about that. Maybe we can go in that at another time. Approaching death and death itself, the dissolution, the dissolution of the physical form is always a great opportunity for spiritual realization. This opportunity is tragically missed most of the time since we live in a culture that is almost totally ignorant of death, as it is almost totally ignorant of death. Huh. It misses the many opportunities or portals to move into a state of consciousness. When you realize that death is an illusion, just as your identification with form was an illusion, the end of illusion, that's all that death is, is the end of the illusion. It is painful only, now get this, as long as you cling to the illusion. I recently saw people that had hadn't seen, I haven't seen in years. I see that, experience that a lot. I recently made contact with people I knew in the 70s uh, and reacquainted with them. And it's a little shocking what time does to the human form. Boy, if you haven't seen somebody for 15, 20 years and then you see them, you go, whoa. A lot of change went on during that time. And I almost felt inclined to say, my God, what did time do to you? So yes, on a level of form, you as this form, you are subject to time and subject to the impermanence, which implies time. Short-lived, fleeting, all forms are. Everything, every form is quite fleeting. So remember, when you are totally identified with form or with body, you don't really know that. 
How many people out there don't know? They don't know they're more than their body and the five senses of the body. You only exist in a state of fear and desire because you're so identified because you don't know who you are. It's really quite an amazing realization when you realize how fleeting all forms are. Not as an intellectual fact or belief, but to see how short-lived all forms are. Think about this. And when you grow older, you see it very clearly. So true. When you reach the age of 60, 65, 70, 75, people around you begin to die. And you begin to say, there's nobody hardly left that I know. I know this is happening to many of us who are at that age, people we've known, we are hearing of their death and they're moving on. Psalms 23, very familiar scripture. Though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Notice, shadow of death. Shadows aren't real. If I get behind the light and the light can't get through me, it will cause an absence of light and I will cast a shadow. Shadow is the absence of something. So though I walk through this time of illusion of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. The I am presence is always with us. Proverbs 21 and 6 says a man or woman, it doesn't say a woman, but I am, a man or woman who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. I know a lot of people. You think the people that are not in their body in your life are dead. I know a lot of people in their body that are dead. A lot of people are dead. Consciously. Not living the manifest life of the higher attributes of love and peace, etc. And the Bible is very clear to tell us that these people are dead in their sin. That's what it says. They're dead in their sin. And we talked about what that actually means. I want to give you a little bit from A Course in Miracles. Now, uh, all this that I'm giving you is for contemplation. I'm not saying it's the gospel. I'm not saying it is your truth. But even if you don't feel it's your truth now, it may be next week, six months. Most of what I teach today at one time, I don't know if I believed even. And some of the things that come through me that the Holy Spirit teaches, I'm still catching up to see if I believe it. Not everything comes through me is at my level of belief. I hear things come out of my mouth and I go, but oh, wait a minute. Do I believe that? I have to contemplate it. And that's the difference of what's coming from you and what's coming through you. In the Course of Miracles under Incorruptible Body, you who are dedicated to the incorruptible have been given, through your acceptance, the power to release from corruption. What better way to teach the first and fundamental principle in A Course on Miracles than by showing you that the one that seems to be the hardest, hardest can be accomplished first. The body can but serve your purpose. In other words, what it is saying is the body can be used by the Holy Spirit or it can be used by the ego as a tool of communication. For instance, I'll take myself and other, other teachers, ministers, however you want to call us, we do our best to hear the voice of God, of spirit. And, 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 and if spirit 
has a language, it's the language of spirit. If I was over in Sweden or some country that spoke another language than I've learned in English, I, I wouldn't understand it. I wouldn't understand it because I'm not trained in that language. So people from Sweden speak Swedish, people from German speak German. Most Americans who are born here know English or should know English, uh, I think. But if you're from spirit, you're going to speak spirit. So you've got to hear God's language, which is spirit. Now, our place and where we sometimes are short is trying to interpret God's language into the language of the people. And there's many times after I've talked that I feel, did I reach a level? Was I good at interpreting the language of spirit so that people could understand it in the language that they've learned in their minds? So with you, I'm, I'm trying to speak the language of English because that's the learned language, I'm sure, of the majority, if not all, that's listening to me right now. But you see, terrestrial earth languages are limited. When I started this journey of going beyond symbolism of the Bible, for instance, and I've shared this with you, my first portal that opened up to me was that nothing in there spoke English. I know I've said this a million times, but I think it's a place to really a starting point. It was my starting point that I realized Jesus did not speak English. Paul did not speak English. Jeremiah did not speak English. Nobody spoke English. So I realized that reading it in English was not reading it in context of the time and the culture in which it was spoken. Fortunately, I lived in a time in which I did not have to go to years of school to learn those languages because somebody had done it for me, such as Strong's Concordance. What he had done is go through every word of the New Testament and put it in Greek and every word of the Old Testament in Hebrew. All I had to do was look it up and find those words. That's called what we call collapsing time. And so I didn't have to take the time to go and learn those things because it had already been done for me. So I appreciate those pioneers who have gone before us so that we can get on the highway to wholeness and not be cutting paths where there is no paths. We need to find a way that we can move quickly, especially in this the last lifetime for you who understand that in third dimension. This has been a really fast journey that we've been on in this lifetime. Maybe more than any other lifetime that we've ever lived, we have really been accelerated. The scripture comes to me that says that things will not last unless time is shortened for the elect's sake. That's a scripture. Well, time has been shortened for us that we can learn in this lifetime what maybe would have taken another four or five lifetimes or so to learn. I know for me that's true. I can't speak for you, but I know that in this lifetime, I took on the contract of learning what it would take in four lifetimes. That's why I had to start at 17. That's why I had to have this fervency. This is why the, uh, that God has set a life for me that I did not have to spend a lot of time in the survival of third dimension systems. If I'd have had to go to, to jobs and, and work for corporations and whatever, I wouldn't have had the time to do the research and the study. I wouldn't have the freedom to go and travel. I, didn't have this, I would not have the situation to follow spirit and be free to do it. The universe made sure that I did not get tied down in any way that would deter me from this accelerated path that I've been on for over 50 some years. You might want to check in on that one and see about yourself. Maybe that'd make you understand your life 
and why it's been what it is. That you're not a victim, but you made a contract so that you land at a certain place before you go through that tunnel. In other words, let us undo death now before the physical death would take place if that happens. And I say if because I think anything is possible in any way. The body can but serve your purpose. Yes, it can. Again, I'm glad for my body so I can communicate you as a spiritual being. I can step down into a language in which I can put God's language in my language. And that's why it says, hear what the Spirit is saying. When I'm talking, don't be checking out my English and checking out my grammar and checking out the way I say things. Hear the Spirit in it. What is the Spirit saying to you? Not what is David saying to you. What is the Spirit saying to you? Because it said, the Spirit searches the the deep things of God that are foolishness to the natural man. Hmm. As you look on it, the body, so will it seem to be. Death, were it true, would be a final and complete disruption of communication, which is the ego's goal. In other words, it wants to shut down the communication that we have, which God can use to speak to us and shut it down in death. Those who fear death See not how often and how loudly they call it and bid it to come to save them from communication. For death is seen as a safety, a great dark savior from the light of truth. The answer to the answer. The silencer to the voice. There it is. This is why I want to stay around. This is why I want to be as healthy as I can because I don't want to be, my voice to be silenced if I have dedicated my voice to God's voice. The ego would love for me to be silenced because I allow in my voice the voice of spirit. That speaks for God. Yet the retreat to death is not the end of conflict. Only God's answer is its end. Wow. This goes on and on about death. In our book, we started talking about death. And we talked about how that Jesus showed us how death takes place in the way of undoing and letting go and diminishing a life that we are not living, the life of ego. That's the death that he taught us. Again, it's not proven to me that he had a physical death on a cross. Maybe he did. Again, I can't prove that. And you know, it doesn't matter to me. about some of these things. I'm not going to spend my time debating things that I don't think anybody really knows. A lot of things that we think we know is because we read it somewhere or heard somebody say it, and it's not self-knowledge. What you should know is what has come from you, not what has come from somebody else. I'm not asking you to make me your authority on how you believe about something. I'm doing my best, again, I'm going to say this, to let the voice of the Spirit come through me to the voice of God in you. Because like resonates with like. And if the voice of Spirit comes through my voice, it awakens that in you, and it becomes self-knowledge. And that's the only knowledge that you want to qualify into a belief system because what you finally qualify into the belief system drives cellular replication. Your body is always the manifestation of your beliefs. What you believe 
shows up in the body because your beliefs is the word made flesh. And that's why the only way to change and raise our bodies is to raise our consciousness in some way or another. There's a question on page 12 in your book that says, we, are we the generation who will overcome death? Everyone of every generation has had the potential to overcome death, it says. Look at Enoch. Remember that? You remember the story? How it was up to each one and how he deals with the, with the enemies in his own consciousness. When he had given up all attack thoughts, all ideas of being a victim or a, a, uh, a person that's a... Per, per, yeah. <laughs> He will have swallowed up death. One of my favorite things, and I've said it at every so-called funeral or awakening I've ever done, is, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be abolished is death. When you discover that you have no enemies, you will discover you have no death. Your mind is reaped one enemy at a time. When you sit on the right hand of God, now metaphysically that means when you share the power, thrones are power. When you sit on the throne of the power with God, not under God, with God, your enemies are made your footstool. In other words, your so-called enemies will be put under your thinking and seen for the illusion they are. Wow. In the kingdom, you have no enemies, no disasters, no diseases, no competition, no jealousy, no greed, no adultery, no male, no female, no anger, no resentment, no death. The more human thoughts, enemies that are reaped, the brighter your radiance will shine. Let us make one thing clear, it says. There is only one generation that will not taste death. That is the generation of the Christ. Wow. The generation of the Christ. It is not some number in the lineage of man. When you totally stand up in your Christ self, then death will not be able to touch you because it will, not, it will be out of your consciousness. Death. I've even heard people say to other people, you are dead to me. <clears throat> you are dead to me. That doesn't mean they're dead. It means you're dead to me. And unfortunately, we have made the true essence of God death to us by religion. Religion has given us a substitute of an idol and an image of God that is not real. And we have given our power to it. Psalms 115 says, they made idols. And the idols did not have feet and could not walk, eyes and could not see, ears that could not hear. And they that made the idols became like the idols. That's the scary thing. If you see God as vindictive. A lot of what's going on right now is, uh, is very much not just politically, but also religiously influenced. And when you see the God of the Old Testament, then you become like the God of the Old Testament. You come against this and you become those people. You start pointing your finger. It's them. It's them. It's them. If we can get rid, if we can change them, good. If we can't change them, let's get rid of them. And don't realize that the image is in their own mind. It's psychological, projected on the outside. So all these wars that have gone on in the world Somebody has won and somebody hasn't won most of these wars. The people who won went, look what God did for us. God empowered us. We are truly the chosen. And look at them. Because they didn't serve our God, they lost. I hear it all the time. Whether it's some sport event. Look, we prayed and what God did, we won. At the expense of somebody losing. And like they were praying supposedly to the same God and they lost. But this bunch had a 
hotline to God that the other team didn't have. It's just crazy, isn't it? When you stop and think how ridiculous it all is and how this plays out on the world stage, boy, we need to grow up. I'm not going to say a lot, but I'll tell you what. If you watched the debate last night, my, my, my. And that bunch is praying. The other is praying. We're all praying for a different result. We need to all give up. You know, the thing that is missing the most that I keep looking for is communication. When will people talk to each other? Nobody talked to each other last night. On either side, nobody, nobody really talked. We have no communication. Without communication, we will not evolve out of this condition that we're in today. I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned about our country. I'm very concerned about the world. I'm concerned about humanity itself. Join me in prayer. Let's pray. And what I'm going to pray, thy will be done. I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane right now. I'm sweating as it was, great drops of blood. Because I've come to the end to know what to do from my human self. Maybe I'm right on some things that I believe about things. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. All I can pray, I'd like to see this cup pass. This cup that I believe should pass. But nevertheless, thy will be done. Whatever that is. Maybe I don't know what it is. Maybe I don't know the plan completely. Somebody said to me that they talked to somebody today that says, um, because this uh, crisis should de proceed transformation, may we need four more years of crisis. Do we? No, what we need is an intervention of the appearing and the coming of Christ in a many-membered people. That's what we need. If we don't, maybe we're going to get four more years. I don't know. And I'm saying four years, however, which way you look at it. Some of you is going to think it's terrible if, if this side gets in and others think that side's going to get in. I mean, there's, it's all relative. That's what it is in time and space. It's all so relative. But let us pray today, Father, Mother, God, thy will be done beyond my will, even though I'd like to see the cup pass from me the way I see it and the way I believe I appeal to that which is greater than I. For the Father and I are one, but he is greater than I. I appeal to that intelligence of the Christ consciousness that, may not, that sees what I may not see and knows what I may not know. We call upon you, divine mind, divine intelligence. Your will be done. Bless you is my sincere prayer. Thank you. Um, I hope this has been something that causes you to contemplate, to meditate, and to be empowered. O oh, death, where's your sting? O oh, grave, where's your victory? Thank you for your support. Continue to support. Also, you that are, are not attending, we are trying to be a blessing to our, our wonderful Tim, who does more than some of you would even know. It's amazing how much he has dedicated his time and life to this community and to keep all this going. And even though he's uncomfortable about it, we're going to do it anyway, but we're going to be a blessing to him. And there are cards for you that are coming here, but maybe you'll get your own card. Send a little note. And send a love offering. Let's give him a good love offering. Tim asks for so little, so little, that we want to be a blessing to him. And it's not about receive, receive. And that's all we do is we receive from Tim, receive from Tim. But we must give back or the circle is not complete of giving and receiving. So please join us. You can send it to 7300 Mallard Creek Road in Charlotte, North Carolina. That is 28262. Or you can bring it uh, the next time you come to the center. 
uh, and receive it, or you can do it through, I guess, credit card too. If you let us know that's what it's for, we'll mark it for that. Thank you for joining us today, Sunday morning. Uh, it's going to be always a special Sunday morning. Last Sunday morning, the presence was just here. I'm telling you, the presence was here. It was a great service. And I'm looking forward to this Sunday. And the next Sunday then is going to be a musical Sunday with um, Paul and Cindy. And uh, it's going to be a great day uh, on that next Sunday. So, oh yeah, next Sunday is the Power Sunday, which is zeal. I'm going to call it uh, something clever, like, uh, what did I say? Something about zeal. I had, a, I had a title I really liked. I'll think of it again. But the color is orange, and it is the great power of zeal. And zeal is motivation, inspiration, and we're going to put a lot of that into our lives on Sunday. So become uh, a part of that at 11.15. Try to get here a little early if you want to get a seat. It was full. About every seat was full that we can do now with the six feet apart. So I would suggest you get here uh, by 11, 11, 10 at the latest and get you a seat or you may not find one. So be on time. All right, bless you is my sincere prayer until our next time. Thank you.